Let's podcast alongside Joe Giglio. I'm Joe Ovias, Eford Studios, downtown Raleigh. Thanks to Empire Properties. And we're brought to you by Copiers Plus. Check them out online, copiers-plus.com. You might be a small business, medium business. You might not understand how much money you could be wasting with your own print management. So have Copiers Plus give you an assessment. Understand how much you're printing, how much you can save. There's document management as well. All key things that you need as a small to medium-sized business. And most, most importantly, their local Joe, copiers-plus.com. So we thank them for presenting Ovias and You got Joe my email Yo. yesterday, right? Of Did the contract that I need you to print out and sign. Oh, do I need to do that? That's what the email said. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm oh. the one who usually doesn't check emails. Did I have a Jillio moment? <laughs> yes, you did. Oh, crap. <laughs> God, I used to bust your balls about not checking email all the time. I think it's okay to say it now. We're going to have a deal <laughs> with North Carolina football. Yeah, very excited about this. I am too. Very we excited got about this. Tickets to give away mm -hmm. each game, mm -hmm. four tickets. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to figure out some creative ways to give away those tickets. I've already got one creative way. Oh, boy. Which I know you'll be excited about. I just have to run it by Greg Hatem to make sure we have the space to do it. Okay. Uh, so we'll do that. Okay. Because I look, their schedules. I know, I know people are like, oh, Clemson and State are away. Yeah. They have a really good home schedule they do. this year. They do. So, but but <laughs> perhaps me putting the cart before the horse here, <laughs> that's the contract I need you to sign. All right. And I'll send do that over to them. I will do that so today. Th I'll that's do that today. The Kyocera comes into play. That's where Copiers Plus is our friend. Hopefully, and your friend too, because it's going to help our listeners win tickets to UNC football games. Hopefully, the NCAA doesn't come in and deny that contract like <sighs> they did with this, this Seth has Walker. Me, I'm, I'm completely lost here on what could the possible reason be here okay. for the NCAA to finally put their foot down about somebody's eligibility in the year 2023. Let's okay, so they, we we come to find this out yesterday. Uh, North Carolina puts out a statement. Mac Brown puts out a statement. Uh, Tez Walker's statement is very much like, like you feel for the guy. I mean, you really do. He, he basically thought he was doing the right things. And his journey to get to North Carolina is, is pretty interesting and adds context as to why a lot of people are shocked by the fact that the NCAA did not sign off on this waiver. So quick, quick context points to for people who are trying, wait, wait a minute, what's, what's going on here? Because to your point, they've been signing off on waivers like, nonstop. Like it's a giveaway. However, <laughs> however. Back on January 11th of this year, the Division One Council of Presidents and sure. yada, 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 sure, put in a new rule that they were going to start cracking down on, very specifically, undergraduate transfers okay. who were seeking waivers on that second transfer. So Walker, this is important context, Walker transferred to North Carolina as an undergrad, as an undergrad, before before they decided to do this, okay. the transfer so portal from the post facto this, rules here. Going this on. is some December transfer portal stuff, and then in January they put this. They say, "All right, this is what we're going to start doing." So again, important context: Walker transferred to UNC before the NCAA announced that they were going to start cracking down on these second uh, these second transfer waivers. But let's also get into the journey. <laughs> Of Tess Walker to North Carolina, okay? Okay. He tore his ACL right out of the gate. And he deferred his enrollment, I think, at uh, East Tennessee State. All right? He ends up at Central. He's a North Carolina kid. Yes, so, Charlie. So he ends, up in, he ends up at Central. Well, what happened in 2020 with the MEAC, Joe? They did not play football. They did not play a single down of football. So, unknown what's going on with the future. So he didn't play a single down of football right. at ETSU. He didn't play a single down of football at Central because they canceled the season in 2020. So he transfers oh, to... This is some Chandler Zavala stuff because even though your group didn't play, they mm -hmm. still counted the year against you. So he transfers to Kent State mm -hmm. where he plays for two years. Right. All right. But Kent State's coach, what is it? Uh, Sean Lewis joins Deion Sanders' group Colorado. at Colorado. Okay. So the coaching staff is just gone. All right. So he decides, I'm going to go to UNC. You grew up in Charlotte, you're North Carolina kid. There's a sick family member who has not seen Walker play. Okay. So you come to North Carolina. It's a two and a half hour drive from Charlotte. Actually, it's less than that. It's like it's actually, Chapel Hill. It's a Chapel Hill. It's about two and a half hours, actually. Eh, a little less than that. On a good day. So two and a half hours for the sake of the conversation. Two and a half hours from Charlotte to Chapel Hill. That allows the family members to come see him. North Carolina's opera. I mean, 
Mac Brown's going to ACC kickoff talking about yeah, how important Walker same, is. Same with Drake May. To this group. And yeah. Drake May was hype about it as well. Then they find out this week that, no, this is happening. Similar situation played out at Florida State, too. But for our purposes here locally, North Carolina and what happened with Walker is, you know, the, the topic of conversation. So the NCAA remains consistent in their inconsistency. And they're screwing Walker here. They're screwing, they're screwing somebody who essentially did everything they thought we were doing right and transferred this at a time. This is based on being a transfer. This has nothing to do with running out of eligibility. No, he still has two years of eligibility left. So they're saying as a second time transfer, he yes. has to sit out this year. Yes. Okay. But again, that rule was put into place after the transfer portal well, window had opened and closed in December. Okay, so originally, remember, let's go back to untangle in, in context a little bit. Okay, here. originally, forever, you had five years of you had five years to play four seasons. Mm -hmm. Okay, or, or commonly a redshirt year, most either a medical redshirt or, or as we see in football, just take the year off, get acclimated. Five yeah. years to play four. The pandemic gave everybody essentially six to play five. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's where the clock is for a lot of these players. And, and that clock's about to run out next year. Okay. Now, <laughs> under old transfer rules, you uh, still five to play four. You ha you use one of those as a transfer to sit out and mm -hmm. you still use, but you would then have to play the next year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then they went to the portal, which was you can transfer right away. One Well, no, then they went to a grad transfer. You can transfer right away and play if you're a grad transfer. Then they went to the portal and said, okay, everyone is allowed to transfer one time for free, whether you're a graduate or not. Mm -hmm. Now we have this rare case of Walker being in school for this long and not being a graduate and had already used his one time transfer to from, from uh, Kent state. Kent. No, they, he used oh, his transfer from, from central, central to, to Kent. Kent state. Yeah. So they must've, or they waived that year and said the East, one of those they waived basically. Mm -hmm. So they're basically saying, we already gave you a waiver. So you're now a two time undergraduate transfer. We're also trying to give you, you're also looking for a second waiver. Mm -hmm. Now, this is all preposterous in a world where literally 35 miles down the road, you have a guy who's going into his eighth season for all sorts of different reasons. But that's injuries the thing. And there's, there's different like, reasons for these things. And <laughs> I just laid out Walker's journey to North Carolina and a reasonable person would look at this and go, yeah, man, it makes not, sense. But it's a really odd time for the NCAA to right come before down the start of the season. on players yeah. in, a, in at the same time where they're about to. And I know people are like, you know, and, and, and to your point, we get a little overwrought with our think of the children stuff. Mm -hmm. But it all is under this umbrella of college athletics. Like you don't care about these athletes. You don't compensate them. Nope. So you don't care about them. Okay. That's number one off the bat. Now you're putting them in conferences where they're going to travel all over the place. Again, your actions are demonstrating that you don't care. So now you can't selectively act like, Oh, they can. Well, it's the way of the NCAA. Do you know, what's really going to throw the, the earth off as access. Yes. If we give Tez Walker, a second waiver to play immediately at North Carolina. Like who, who are we hurting here? What? And again, in the world of the NCAA and their, in their duplicitousness, mm -hmm. when they argue in a case, an actual violations case, they say every case is its own. There, there's no such snowflake. thing as a precedent. Every mm -hmm. case is individual. We take each case uniquely. Mm -hmm. So why are you worried about setting a precedent with Tez Walker? For what? All you're really doing is selectively deciding who you're going and what rules you're going to enforce. Why any school, again, would put up with this, I don't know. But this gets back to our conversations about football should be its own thing. It is. It should be. Football should be its own thing with mm -hmm. its own rules and on its own island. Mm -hmm. And the more and more people talk about this, the more and more the chances of, of likely ever happening, it will happen. And, and shouts this Chip Kelly this week being the one like, hey, you realize Notre Dame is an independent in football and, and participates in a conference and all of their other sports. Weird, well, huh? Why can't we all do this? Hmm. It's funny how that works out, right? Maybe we can do that. Housekeeping. All right. So we're getting close to official shirts. Very excited about this. I showed you. Are you going to show those to the, to the public at large? Not yet. 
Not yet. It's a tease. It's a tease. You're so good. You liked them though, right? Who came up with those? Breaking tea. Wow. Well, now I gave him the wow. idea. I gave him the idea. And then they turned it into that. Um, wow. So I, I kind of was hit with inspiration from previous projects. And I thought to myself, huh, what actually pairs well with a defunct radio show? I know. A def defunct, defunct. We laugh. The team that never won. Defunct professional teams in North Carolina. And how can we incorporate these things? So uh, hopefully we'll get, and, and there's a, there's a third shirt, which is just, a, you know, the positive vibes only, you know, obvious Gilio. But hopefully those shirts, hopefully we'll, they'll be on the Breaking Tea website by the end of the week. <sighs> very excited about this. Very, very excited about this. They're even better than my succulent shirt right now. Hey, what's, what in the name of Friedlander is that, <laughs> by the way? I went, over to the, I went over to a certain store on whatever road that is. Wake Forest yeah. Road? Yeah. Behind a certain super grocer that I enjoy <laughs> tremendously. <laughs> And instead of buying clubs, I was like, ah, I'll save my money. Bye bye. This shirt instead. I like the shirt. Yeah. It's not bad. Something... Birdie is this group. Okay. It's not something that I thought that you would wear, but I like it. The material is off the charts. Oh, it's like moisture wicking, super mm -hmm. soft, that kind of thing. I like it. Is that, do you want to put an OG logo on something like that? Uh, potentially, we'll, right. have have to, we'll have to talk work about a little that. bit of magic. Maybe get our guy. Yeah. We'll have to talk about that. Fat Perez in on that one. <sighs> the king, man, the yep. king. It's funny how certain people know who that guy is, and I'm completely oblivious. Like I, I caught, I up, didn't know either. I caught up with our former colleague Alec Campbell uh, last night. Yeah, and he's like, "Yo, man, I love that that Wyndham show you guys did." I'm like, "Of <laughs> yeah, course you did. That's like catnip <laughs> for you and Jilly." I was like, "Yo, man, I like that was my like I loved that show. I like I I ate it all up." I'm like, "So you know who Fat Perez is?" He goes. Yeah, yeah, he's like you know, a barstool guy, whatever. But I know who he is. I'm like, of course you do, because you're a golf hardcore guy. So it makes total sense. Uh, speaking of being hardcore about things, hometown realty is hardcore about agents. They're hardcore about making sure that your house sells quick, and more importantly, making sure that you can get into the house that you want. You can check them out online at myhtr.com. Again, that's myhtr.com. Six locations, more than 250 agents. Look, don't fool around trying to get into the right house. Don't fool around like, oh, I'm going to go to one of these independent brokers who give you a lowball offer and, and don't take care of you. Go to myhtr.com, get the best value for your house and get set up before the school year begins. Also, Whitaker and Hamer sponsoring Ovius and Jillio. Check them out online at wh.lawyer. Uh, I feel like we're going to have to have another conversation with our friend Josh about contracts and grant of rights. And I don't know, they haven't put ink to paper on the college football playoff and how they were going to set it all up. Maybe maybe Josh has some opinions no, on that too. We need Josh on an emergency pod. Maybe we'll try to get him tomorrow. Maybe. Because there is one question about like, because you and I keep questioning what is possible value does Stanford, Cal, and SMU have? Which we'll get to in a second, yeah. And apparently there are some questions about whether if you add more teams, what does that do for the grant of rights? Well, and, I and do How know does that help Florida State or doesn't help Florida State? Right? Which this all seems to be a... Uh, an attempt to placate yeah. Florida State, which, funny enough, in history has happened before. It has, which we'll get to a little bit later on in our conversation with Holden Thorpe, former chancellor uh, but at the North world's Carolina. greatest URL, wh.lawyer. Josh Whitaker, Joe Hamer, go check him out, wh.lawyer. Nice. Big, big downtown steak restaurant vibes with that yeah, I feel jingle like right there. You've got a martini little, coming up. Uh, maybe even a pineapple. Does that take you back to the time hanging out with Jim Kane? Mm -hmm. Is that what that is that what that's about? It's very much so. back in the day. Very much so. so you you mentioned Shout out to Dan Reynolds. You mentioned what was going on in the ACC, and every every national college football insider has some sort of source, uh, some sort of angle on what's going on right now, and in the wake of. The Pac-12 teams leaving for the Big 12 and the Big 10, you're left with the Pac-4. And apparently, the ACC has been kicking the tires the last couple of days on adding Stanford and Cal. You and I were both, <laughs> and we've texted people like, what? And most of the response that we've been getting from people is, well, they're just doing their due diligence. Well, how long does it take to do the due diligence on this and understand that this doesn't really make any sense? Shout out to uh, Joel Anderson, big fan of Joel Anderson over at Slate, where this is 1.55 a.m. in the club and the lights are on and you're like, all right. And the ACC is essentially, 
What are y'all doing after this? Even before the preposterousness of SMU entered this conversation. <laughs> right, then SMU shows up. Shout out to listener Jameson, uh, who's like, man, this is like me at the end of the semester with all my C bucks, my convenience store bucks <laughs> at uh, at NC State. Uh, and I just, we were the opposite then because mine were gone in the first right. week. Right, <laughs> his was like, oh man, like how how many bugles can I take home uh, with me as I gotta I gotta fulfill this uh, this this card? But anyway, it, the whole thing's a mess. Uh, without saying who this source is, ah, okay, this, this is kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> this is even before SMU. All right. Cal Stanford may be the dumbest in a long line of dumb ideas by the <laughs> ACC. All right. So people are trying to make sense of what this is about. All right. I can't. The only way it makes sense is if you're looking at it from a couple of different angles. The first one is how badly do Stanford and Cal or SMU want to be in the ACC and what share are they willing to take? So now we get into my favorite topic of conversation, the sliding scale. Okay. If they are willing to take a cut rate deal to join the ACC, take a a smaller share of the pie to join the ACC and have stability, that means they can then go back to ESPN and potentially get more ACC network cable subscriptions in Texas for SMU, in California for Stanford and Cal which would increase the revenue that would then be distributed to the other schools. And Florida state would be happy because remember everything's to placate sure. Florida state and Clemson. That implies that anyone anywhere cares about SMU. Thank you. Cal. Thank you. Or Stanford. Right. That that's, that's the assumption that you think you can go to market with these teams, which I will then ask the presidents who are quote unquote, kicking the tires or doing their due diligence or deep diving into the financials. Did you just see what happened to the Pac-12 where they went to market with a whole ass conference? All right. And the best they could get was a shit deal from Apple that was broken down into incentives. Essentially, uh, as somebody as somebody pointed out, I think it was I want to say it was a FOIA request. I want to say it was some president that essentially said, you're asking us to sell candy bars house to house to make this work. So my favorite, my favorite line, my tagalongs, like we act like this is the Girl Scout cookie marathon. Like, essentially, that's what it was. Let's go door to door to try to sell these things. And that's how we're going to make money. So if the entirety of the conference could not go to market and get a same rate deal that the Big 12 just got from ESPN, what makes you think that the leftovers of the Pac-12 are going to do anything to really boost your financials? And then also you throw- Cal is the worst run athletic department in the country. Yes. Like at some point with an administration that actively goes against athletics. I mean, I think they just didn't they just kill the baseball program and the baseball program. Like keep asking who's going to be the petty. You keep asking who's going to be the first to tap out. Yeah, they would they would literally be better off tearing down their football stadium and selling the real estate. That's how much that's how bad off they are. And they just renovated it Mm -hmm. and put themselves like. This is this is McClatchy Media back in the day mm-hmm. buying newspapers in 2008 and Bank of America signing off on that for for a trillion a trillion dollars. Okay, yeah, this, that's how stupid this is. Like Cal, at some point, you just have to tap out and say we can't do this anymore. Mm-hmm. And actually, the Pac-12 did them a favor because now Cal can make, go back yeah. to being a world class university, mm-hmm. and they could probably tear down their football stadium and sell condos on the land that is amongst. <laughs> the most valuable real estate in the country. I'm trying to galaxy brain what the presidents in the 80s are thinking about looking at SMU, well, Stanford, just, and Cal. We have a, we're about to have a conversation with someone that is going to explain to you these presidents. And I'm going to, I'm going to watch my language here. But oh, for once, <laughs> these presidents, <laughs> they get into a popsicle measuring contest. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. it's like, oh, oh, you want to hang out with West Virginia? Mm-hmm. Oh, oh. Oh my! They're not a member of the AAU. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want Louisville? Come on! How look at their you? graduation rate. Mm-hmm. You know, and yes, this hits home a little bit because yet Duke and Virginia and Carolina they act like the only thing that matters is graduation rate. Wake Forest, and then you look at State's graduation rate, and you're like, "Wow, State must be oh, they're a terrible school because their graduation rate is terrible." You no, know, people like, wash out. That's yeah, why. and they wash people out. They wash people it's out. It's harder to get into those schools, as, but then once you get in, they keep them in for that reason. As someone who washed out of computer science, trust me, 
Yeah. You wash out really quick. I saw a lot of people in my freshman class that just could not cut it. I mean, I I got the I got wise and switched my majors. Shout out to first year college because otherwise I would have really been washed yeah. out. But first year college was a pro- pilot program at that time, and that's what got me into these the presidents. Think, oh, people, ninety thousand people are going to show up to watch me read a book. No, no, sir, no. So the galaxy brain thinking is that you're putting that's yourself. That's the disconnect, though, Joe. That's the disconnect. Oh, I agree. You have people don't realize this. I didn't realize it. Holden Thorpe didn't realize it. The presidents are the ones who make decisions in college football mm-hmm. and college basketball and mm-hmm. college sports. You're talking about people like Holden Thorpe who had zero inclination to follow or care about sports because they were trying to lead mm-hmm. what they thought was a world-class university worried about academics. And they think about in that. And that's the lens they think about it in. And this is why Mike Krzyzewski has been screaming forever. Why don't we have people who are assigned to run these sports independently? Well, because they're too and busy. And do what is best for not only these sports, but the players in these sports. They're too busy making sure that Tess Walker doesn't play at UNC. Exactly. That's, for what? That's the key. <laughs> for what? If they're trying to position, if the ACC is trying to position itself so that when things end up being basically two conferences in college football, the SEC and the Big Ten, and they're trying to pick at schools that they know will stick around and become Big East 2.0, well, then you're just essentially signing your own death certificate as a conference at this point, because you're just going to give Florida State and Clemson, Clemson more reason to want to leave. Financials aside, the, my understanding now of the group... not the time to panic. No, I agree. The best move, it's the old war games. The best move is to not play. Just stick out with your grant of rights. You've got the grant of rights. It's That's the your beauty leverage and point. the curse. Yes, it's the golden handcuffs. I use the golden handcuffs term all the time. You're locked in, you're making money, but also you're decidedly third place and by a large amount of money. Okay, but just wait until the expanded playoff starts. I agree. And Oklahoma Aha. and Texas don't get in. Aha. And UC- USC and US- UCLA don't get in. And Seattle and well, uh, Oregon me, don't get in. Let me wrap this point about Florida State and Clemson and the grant of rights. My understanding of the grant of rights is that if these schools come on, they're the ones. Like You're adding those members. They're tied to the grant of rights. It doesn't change anything about the current membership. However, if only we knew someone who drew up the grant of rights. How, yeah, right. Mm. However, why would you do anything to give Florida State a reason right. to try and challenge it? Because you could easily get a lawyer to go, ah, you've added Cal, a depart- as, we, as we just pointed out, a department that does not care about athletics, is poorly run, and wants out it's of this broke. whole game. It's broke broke. broke. Actually broke. Okay, like no, for real broke. broke. In. <laughs> All right. And Stanford. They're not bringing bucks to the seats. SMU, like where are they on the pantheon of Texas schools? The Pony Express? You want to bring the Pony Express? If I'm a Florida State lawyer, now I'm suddenly on Florida State's side. That's how dumb this is. I find myself on Florida State's side if they do this because you'd go, you are actually devaluing the ACC by doing this and we want out. And that's what they could fight in court. Well, I think Florida State, when they said they're not worried about the grant of rights, they they're going to nego- they want to negotiate that and they're yeah. either going to tap into their endowment or they're going to raise enough money in this private equity you know boom to make it work PIF man PIF speaking of the college football playoff to your point about how things are going to play out we actually don't know what the college football playoffs is going to look like now right because we're still a couple years away from that happening so here's Greg Sankey on with Paul Feinbaum yesterday Wait, and is, is this is the last year, right? 24 is supposed to be the expanded. Yes, yes. But here's Sankey on how dynamics have changed and they want to revisit how the college football playoff works. And here in the SEC, we wanted college football to be strong nationally. and We've not seen uh, a West of the Rockies participant in the playoff since, I believe, 2016. And, and so the expansion was about making sure we brought in Western football. Well, now what's happened is Western football has come into other conferences. Uh, the net of that is circumstances have changed. And I think it's it's wise for us to take a step back and reconsider uh, what the format might look like given these changed circumstances. Uh, we've not met on that. I've not had any meaningful conversations, but, but I think we, we have to acknowledge that it is on everyone's mind pending the outcome of some of these additional uh, membership movement pieces. Is there anything about the expansion that, that changes in your in your estimation now with what has happened in recent days? Well, it remains to be seen, but you know, how many FBS conferences will exist? And 
30 or 60 days, particularly as we, we had in the next season, if you want to link that, that time frame. Um, we've been engaged in, in the right kind of conversations around future media opportunities, around the logistical issues and decisions related to the first round of games on campus and, and how do we move then into bowl games. But we do have changed circumstances. Uh, right now, we still have 10 FPS conferences, but there's obviously a great question about whether that will remain. And, and yeah, that, that could create a, a thought in my mind and I think in others about uh, some level of adjustment being made. I do think the access we've created uh, through the 12-team format uh, still seems wise, but maybe there are elements and specifics of what was decided uh, when we had clarity around 10 conferences that, that might need to be adjusted given what's happening right now. So again, that's Greg Sankey, SEC commissioner, on with Paul Feinbaum. And here's where this is going, dude. They're going to remember Sankey was the one who Jedi mind tricked everybody into expanding the playoff and bringing Texas and Oklahoma. They only joined the SEC because of access. Correct. You can join us. They don't, they don't need money. They don't need the money. <laughs> they want the access. And more SEC teams, more access, you're good to go. Sankey, and if I'm whoever the new Big Ten commissioner is off the top of my head, I can remember, like Patetti, right? Is that the guy's name? I'm starting to argue, yeah, this whole business with the top six conference champions Champion. and all that stuff, the highest ranked ones. No, we should just go best teams. Just do what the college football playoff committee is already doing. Get Boo Corrigan out there on ESPN on a Tuesday to give you your 12 best teams and go in there. And what will end up happening is you'll get four SEC teams. You'll get more than that. Four, <laughs> four or five SEC teams. Three, four Big Ten teams. And then everybody else is fighting for scraps. Oh, and Notre Dame. Can't forget Notre Dame. Always included. Always include Notre Dame. And then everybody else, including the ACC, is fighting for scraps. You'll get one ACC team. And that's ultimately what's going to screw Clemson and Florida State. Miami and everybody else, North Carolina, whoever. That's where this is going. You know that's where this is going, right? They see the inch. They've given them daylight. The SEC, which has always been the one that drives this stuff. Because like, oh, we were just trying to do better for college football. No. We were trying to include the Western Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We United should bring States. them on. We should bring them on. Because they no. haven't been involved. No. You're trying to better your situation. <laughs> and this is a way that they can better their situation. I'm telling you, man. They, you, you caught that uh, first round logistics. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, really, I really, yeah it's, it's really hard yeah. to schedule a game and, and get make millions of dollars on your campus. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Crazy. All right, shout out to, speaking of college football, look, college football, there's a reason why we love college stuff, right? It's where you went to school. A lot of great memories are made there. And you're always looking for that pull. And that's where Home Field Apparel comes in. Check them out online, homefieldapparel.com. Use the promo code OG23 for 15% off your first purchase at Home Field Apparel. So if you're a state fan, Carolina fan, Wake Forest fan, they got ECU stuff, they got Virginia say, stuff. They got, the they got, ECU stuff is actually, it's, actually, it's pretty tight. My favorite. It's pretty tight. They got dad hats too. Dad hats. And let's say you don't want any logos. That's fine. You can go core collection. I know you're all about that. But again, use that promo code OG23. I was actually wearing my, uh, I was wearing my 2020 Duke's Mayo Bowl shirt, one of my comfiest shirts. Like the letter, I mean, I've worn it a lot. It's been washed a lot. It gets comfier every single time. Also, a big fan of my Howling Cow shirt too. That's another comfortable shirt that I have from Homefield. So again, use that promo code OG23 at homefieldapparel.com. Now, all right, Joe, I'm gonna pull this up. Okay. My understanding is that we now have a URL. Our guys. He's smart. For Matt over at State Farm? Man. Excuse me? Did you did you get it or do I have No, to? I'm, I'm going to pull it up. I'm going to pull it up. So right okay. now it just says insuregarner.com, which is Matt's website. Correct. It's got but a few points. However, in. however, if I put in the OG insurance. Yes. Oh my goodness. It redirects. That's amazing. Yeah. Look at Matt. So smart. Give him a call to. 919-779-8277. Or better yet, just go to the OGinsurance.com. It'll redirect you. Listen, to if Matt's smart enough to create a URL, <laughs> he's smart enough to take care of all of your insurance needs. Go check him out at the OGinsurance.com. Oh, geez. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. So uh, do you see where ESPN finally gave in to betting? They, they finally gave in, man. Bob Iger. Deal. 
Bob Iger comes back to Disney. Bob Iger always talked about how gambling didn't exactly align with Disney's family values. And then here's Penn National throwing them $1.5 billion over the next 10 years, along with some stock options, to be the operator for a rebranded ESPN bet. bet. Now, you're thinking to yourself, I know what you're thinking. Penn National, why does that sound familiar? Well, they were the ones who had actually purchased Barstool Sports and turned it into the Barstool Sports Sportsbook. Okay. They aligned with, uh, with Dave Portnoy and the crew. And all these podcast companies, and I guess we're part of that now as a small LLC, a lot of these podcast companies were being funded by all of the online sports books. The two biggest are DraftKings and FanDuel. Right. So Penn National gets in with Barstool. Reading yesterday in the Washington Post, front office sports, Wall Street Journal, turns out that they never really penetrated market share. Right now, Penn National did not with Barstool Sports. Okay, Bar, if you look at the Barstool, of the gambling market, they only got single digits of the market okay. share. Guess the guess the two that dominate because FanDuel and DraftKings just dominate. crush. My understand if I I don't have the story in front of me, but I'm pretty sure the number is something like between those two, they take up seventy percent of the online wagering market. Okay. And then the rest of it is scattered with like BetMGM, Caesars Sportsbook. And then we start getting into the smaller groups. And apparently Barstool Sports was in that. So Barstool bought, Portnoy bought back the sportsbook or Barstool itself. So he can just go and do whatever he wants to do. But if I read the story correctly, that they signed a non-compete, meaning that Barstool can't partner up with another online sports wagering company. So they can't go run to FanDuel. They can't run the DraftKings in the near future. But ESPN now takes that. I guess the, the bet is that ESPN and their availability and their dominance in the market will allow Penn to actually crack the double digits of the online wagering world. And ESPN is in a position where they need all I the mean, money they can get. Uh, whose app do you use more than ESPN? As a sports fan, a sports seriously, fan. whose app do you use more than ESPN? So they're going to integrate that. This comes at an interesting time because in the last couple of weeks, Fox got out of their own gambling market because okay. fox bet that was their big play they were one of the first so that movers. was with mgm wasn't it fox bet shut down okay so it's interesting that espn's getting into this at the time where fox is getting out now there are some inherent differences between how fox operates that has no real good online presence right and espn which obviously dominates the market but this tracks with everything in our industry where gambling money is the thing that's going to fund the next 10 years now how far is that going to take you that remains to be seen, but it's fairly obvious that things must be getting real in the Magic Kingdom when they finally decided to take $1.5 billion from a gambling company and flipped it to ESPN bet. That's a that's actually not a lot of money. No, it's not. Like it's not. You're saying over a 10 year period. So over a 10 year gambling. period. They spend more than that on the rights to the NFL every year per year. So it's not a grand scheme. In the grand scheme, it's not a lot of money. But at this point, there every could, little bit helps, man. Yeah, that it's going to take off once you really that ESPN app, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I could see the I could see what they can they can do there. They'll, they'll have to embrace it in a way. Like yes, they have the daily line show and some mm -hmm. other stuff, but they're going to have to embrace it even more so. Uh, as I've talked to you about with golf, sometimes you sometimes you see it on the PGA Tour broadcast, and, and Jim Nance is telling you, "Oh, play this game, and here's the three ball odds," yeah. and you're like, "Huh." No, like you got to fully lean into that. And ESPN is going to have to have, and, and Bill Simmons and uh, Port and I have talked about this forever, having a, a, a gambling pot. Like the, you have to have like a gambling broadcast. Yes. Like here's where the live line is right now. Here's where the total was. You're going to have to Here's what this that. play means towards your bets. You're going to have to You have to, to put that. all of that into a context. You because know why? That's what the youths are kind of sort of into too. But here's the flip side of this. And I feel like... Oh, I'm, you're super serving as well. You, you got to super serve the people in that niche. I'm not diminishing it because, hi, we are a niche. Sure. Okay, we are super serving a local niche. And I feel strongly and you feel strongly that we can make a living that way. So, super serve the niche. Get it off the main broadcast. Because I will scream this. Right. I will scream this from now. I will scream yeah, there's to the more void. people like you than me. Yeah. There are way more people like me who do not give a damn about gambling that actually view a diminished product when you start shoving gambling stuff into broadcast. I don't care. I find it boring. It doesn't mean anything to me because you're not really giving me any analysis. 
all you're really doing is just going on hunches. It's I watch CNBC and be told you should go invest in this stock only to find out that, that stock sucked. So my point is you're going to screw over. The whole point is to get to as many people as possible. All right. The whole point of this podcast is to have people feel included in sports discussions and they understand where things are. The smaller you make that window, man, the harder it is to grow your audience. So I'm really worried about future broadcasts on ESPN that are going to be jamming they don't ESPN bet. Well, they've already, and this is why I'm optimistic because you've already seen them get into all these other secondary broadcasts like yeah. the Manning cast and yeah, everything yeah. else. They have a bazillion channels. They know what they're doing. Yeah. They have a bazillion channels. They have their Instagram or they have their Twitch feeds and everything else. Super serve them there. Get it off my main broadcast because it's going to tick off a lot. You'll like it. I won't. Speaking of things that I like, I like knowing I have value in my old stuff. And you might have that same desire to find out, hey, this old sports card, is it worth anything? It's been sitting in the attic for years. Can I cash it out? There's only one way to find out, Joe. Literally just sold a 1928 World Series program. You did? With Weston's help. Nice. Yeah. That's yep. what I like that. Nice. Yeah. And it was in the attic. Yes. <laughs> so uh, no, there is no artifact that you have, an autograph, a jersey, something yeah. you might think has value. Go check them out at Oak citycards.com or go downtown off of Glenwood. They have such a great space. They're, um, you name a sport, you name a memorabilia, Weston can help you with it. And with cards in particular, got to get them authenticated and graded. It's the most important thing to do to get them a maximum value for your, for your, for your cards. Shout out to Mosquito Authority and Pest Authority as well. Mosquito Authority, as you know, this summer I've been telling you about it. It's been gross. It's been rainy. Uh, that leads to a lot of mosquito breeding and mosquito authority has done an awesome job of keeping that stuff at bay. And with the heat, I think like today's highs in the nineties, you got critters trying to come in, man, roaches, insects, ants, all that stuff. Pest authority can take your care of your house as well. Yeah. Hayes Lancaster and his crew. It's not just mosquitoes, not just bugs. Get those mice in the attic, get that moisture under your house. You don't want that. Like Hayes's crew walked into my house and they were like, you, you, do you smell that? And I'm like, no, no. They're like, you, you you got moisture under your house. You you do not want that getting into a situation where mold and mildew uh, came in, did like that super lining underneath. Mm. Like I would live down there now. I told Jackson, <laughs> man, you you know, you want to move the couch down there. I was gonna say you shouldn't do that. You should move the kids down there, <laughs> give you more room upstairs. I but mean, bugsbite.com, go check them out, bugsbite.com. So uh, in your print days, did you ever tick off a of school? Oh. Yeah, regularly. You hear from the coaches, hear from, you know, an owner or something like that. They were mad at you. Yes, Peter Carmanos, regularly. Yes. But they understood the deal. You don't work for them. So do not work for them. No. Okay. There was part of the yes, I had a I remember a very specific conversation with Mark Gottfried about that. Like, I don't work for you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've had that conversation. Yeah, like, I've had that conversation with state people, no less. I've had that conversation as well. I was like, you don't pay me yeah. that. Uh, or with the Canes. Like, yeah, you know, the, the radio station I was at was the flagship. That doesn't mean I'm on the payroll. It's fine. But I think most people understood that. But what happens when you're on the payroll, mm. when you're a broadcaster? Well, there's certain things that you have to adhere to. Like, I'm not, I don't think I'm giving away the game here, but when John Forzen was the play-by-play announcer for the Carolina Hurricanes, I knew when John was not pleased with things because there was sure. a way that he talked about it, that he was so professional that it wasn't, you know, overbearing and the Canes obviously were cool with it. So this gets us to the Baltimore Orioles. Baltimore Orioles have been pretty good this year, Joe. Yeah. I can, I can tell because my Twitter timeline is filled with a bunch of Orioles fans I didn't know existed. Just like, the O's. Kevin Brown is their, uh, is their play-by-play guy. Kevin Brown was recently suspended because, I guess, of some comments that he made during a broadcast. And Awful Announcing went and found the clip. And here is Kevin Brown. And here's the segment that ended up getting him suspended. For the Orioles, Brandon Hyde has felt like this has been maybe the toughest ballpark to play in, but the Orioles have a chance to do something special today. They've already clinched at least a split in the series, winning two of the first three, and they could pick up a series win behind Tyler Wells today. It's been a minute. The Orioles split a two-gamer with the Rays in June. They had lost their last 15 series here at Tropicana Field. You have to go back to when our now colleague Brad Brock picked up the win in the series finale, June 25th, 2017. The last time the Orioles won a series 
here at St. Pete. Already got three and two at the top this year after winning three of 18 the previous three years combined. It is a stark difference, Ben, and it is not a bad Rays team. It's not like all of a sudden the Rays uh, became slouches in the American League East. They've led this division every day, but now two, and the Orioles once again are back alone in first place. All right, so there's a. if you're watching on YouTube, you saw the graphic and everything else. If you're listening on the podcast, there's a graphic that gets put up. It's all factual. These are all things that came from the game notes. Joe, did you hear anything that would lead you to believe that there was a problem? I'm, I'm just learning now who is actually running the Orioles. Yeah, it's the Angelos family. John Angelos. Yes, it's the Angelos family. Okay. As Adam Eshbaugh pointed out to me, because he's a big like DMV yes. area guy. He's yes. like, well, now that Daniel Snyder's gone... Guess who everybody's going to focus on now? The Angelos family that's done a terrible job. Now, this is a, this has been a thing that all the broadcasters have uh, have been going in on, uh, and people have just been taking their shots. Here's Jason Benetti on the White Sox broadcast with a little subtle shot at the Orioles. You know, they're done with the Orioles for the year, the team in first place in the AL East, but they actually played Baltimore pretty well. They were 6-7 and seven against the Orioles this year, so they lost seven times but they did beat baltimore six times which i hope i don't get suspended by the orioles for saying that whoopsies here I is chip carry had the better one <laughs> i don't think i have the chip carry <laughs> one uh i do have what else do i have here i have dave o'brien on the nesson broadcast with euclid by the way we mentioned that the baltimore orioles are off tonight there's a story that the Orioles have suspended their outstanding television play-by-play -play man, Kevin Brown, indefinitely for going on the air and talking about how tough a time the Orioles had had winning down to Tropicana Field over the years. And somebody in the front office for the Orioles didn't like that. So this gun goes to AT&T Sportsnet. This is the Houston Astros uh, last night. Uh, this obviously was not on the Orioles broadcast, uh, but this was on the Astros broadcast last night as Orioles fans were chanting, free Kevin Brown. I think the fans in a rare move here in Baltimore are calling for the return of their play-by-play -play TV announcer, Kevin Brown. Good for them. All right, so you mentioned Chip Carey. I pulled it up. Here's, okay, here's, here's Chip Carey on Bally from Awful Night. I think the big challenge for the Rays going forward, Brad, is A, they're playing in the East where they've lost, I think, 270 consecutive games to the Orioles. But only three games back, they're going to be without Shane McClanahan, who we were told right before game time today, it's unlikely he's going to pitch again this season as he tries to sort out a forearm problem. Yeah, it's going to be difficult for them. You know, look, the, the Orioles are playing good baseball. They can do no wrong at this point. <laughs> So, yes. Good uh, to see broadcasters sticking up for other broadcasters. Look, man, the Orioles. Look, the, I was reading on Defector this morning that apparently the reason. So Kevin Brown didn't completely leave the broadcast. Okay. He got moved to radio. Okay? okay. But the reason why he got moved to radio, according to Defector, was because the radio guys had been suspended because they weren't wearing team gear on the broadcast. This is radio. They can't see you. So he was doing radio because another guy got suspended. Now, turns out, oh, you got to wear team-issued gear? Do you cool. think? Cool, yeah. I'm okay, sure the cool. team got me something. No, they're <laughs> required to buy polos. They have to buy polos from the team. That's fairly cheap. Yeah, and I always wonder why people end up being pro-management at the end of the day. It will never cease to amaze me. <laughs> Thanks to Breeze Through and Adam. Because breeze through cups today. They got cups. We're gonna have koozies soon. All right. Again, we're gonna have that. Adam. Adam's been talking to me about these blue breeze. The the blue breeze through with an OG koozie for an event we got coming up here in September. I'm very excited about this. And we could potentially give away a breeze through tumbler, lifetime refills. We're, we're gonna, gonna try. One. We're gonna try with the OG mixtape. But seriously, go buy breeze through beer caves, snacks, great service. They've got it. Breeze through markets, gas. And yeah, gas is kind of important, <laughs> gas, but I think that's a given. No, I know, but but there's, there's we sometimes overlook that. But again, be on the lookout. There could be cheap gas on the horizon. Oh, it could thing. be cheap gas on the horizon. And Butcher's Market sponsoring Ovius and Julio. Like, do we even have to do the Butcher's Market's ads anymore? Because you guys do. are doing it for us. We do. Shout out to everybody who's been tweeting at us like, Steak and cheese. 
Yes, I think uh, one of our listeners, Tori, Tori, like posting a selfie outside Butcher's Market, like real deal. <laughs> so they're not lying they're, to you. <laughs> they're great, it's amazing. <laughs> so again, go to uh, go to Butcher's Market. Again, the sandwiches are great. I'm glad that everybody's discovering the sandwiches, but they got a bunch of other great stuff too. It's time to start thinking about your tailgate. They got all the grilling accessories, whether it's the you know the pellets, uh, you know the wood to smoke, charcoal, all that stuff, seasoning. They've got it. So check them out at the butcher's market what's up next what's up next joining us on the heaster automotive group hotline he's he's a friend of the show now he's definitely a friend of the show now we've come so long we've come so far yeah i remember a time when i was more of a topic that wasn't all that friendly but yeah is the former chancellor of north carolina he is now the editor-in-chief of the science magazine this it's it's like more than just one magazine though right you have like a whole family of magazines uh just six which is small compared to a lot of our competitors but uh the flagship uh science is is the one that some people would know although a lot of people think i'm the editor of scientific american which i'm not (laughs) not the same thing not you got to be careful these days with yeah (laughs) So you were you were chancellor at North Carolina during an interesting time, and and we wanted to pick your brain about that time because uh, it's kind of like Battlestar Galactica, right? Everything has happened before; it's going to happen again. And Florida State was not happy back around 2010, 2011, 2012. Maryland is getting ready to leave, and there's this other grant of rights that you have to sign, and it's to secure the future of it. But if I remember reporting from back in the day, Florida State wasn't happy, and they had to be wooed by John Swafford. Uh, the former commissioner of North Carolina. And as a president, you're having these conversations. As a chancellor, you're having these conversations. So what was that time like? What was Florida State upset about? And why did they ultimately sign that grant of rights in the first place if they weren't happy? Yeah, well, first of all, there's a huge irony to all of this because I was the chair of the Council of Presidents when all of this went down. And, you know, as the last guy picked in kickball, my whole life. Uh, it was a pretty, pretty wild place for me to be, but it ended up having a big impact on, on where we are now. Um, so obviously, yeah. So when Maryland left, uh, and we did the Notre Dame deal, I was the chair then. Uh, and then also when we added Louisville and when we did the grant of rights deal. So it Mm -hmm. was a lot, it was a lot for this, um, guy who's, connection with sports ended when I stopped being the defensive tackle on the Honeycutt Giants uh, in Fayetteville, North Carolina. (laughs) Um, But uh, yeah, so when we were trying to do the grant of rights deal, obviously Maryland had left. If we hadn't gotten the grant of rights deal done, I think the ACC would have been in very grave danger Mm -hmm. because everybody else had a grant of rights and that we were competing with. And we still had this exit fee, which we ended up arguing uh, with Maryland about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, We came to, I mean, that was after I left, but they seem to have come to an agreement that everybody went along with. Um, But the exit fee, you know, and you can see why now uh, the exit fee is not a good system because a new conference that wants you, can just figure out a way to, to pay that. Mm-hmm. So we really needed everybody to sign over their, their broadcast rights. And most of us wanted to do it. Uh, there were a couple of schools that um, were a little iffier. And actually, we scheduled one call. Here's a little bit of drama for you. <laughs> we scheduled one call uh, that we thought where we thought we had it. And it turns out there were two holdouts. And of course, statute limitations, you could tell yeah, us who were the Yeah, holdouts. it's UVA and, and Florida State. Okay. Virginia. Virginia. Ball. Yeah, uh, that was all about the conflict between Terry Sullivan and her board. That really okay. didn't have anything to do with sports. Okay. Okay. So politics. Um, that was yeah, politics. Yeah, that was politics. All right. Um, so I told Swafford we really shouldn't have a call because if we have a call and two people vote against it, guys like you are going to figure that out and it could have blown up the whole thing Mm -hmm. Uh, because every time we had a call, as soon as we hung up, (laughs) you saw it, it, we saw it on Twitter. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I ever told you this guys this, but when I did the deal with Bubba Cunningham, uh, we shook hands on the deal. I put him in the car. We were at the residence 
I went back to my computer, I opened Twitter, and it said Bubba Cunningham to be the new uh, athletic director at North Carolina. So anyway, <laughs> that was yeah, it was like 30 seconds or something. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, so I, we, I didn't want to have a call where it wasn't unanimous. So we canceled the call, and I told Swafford, you need to get on a plane to Tallahassee and Charlottesville, uh, which he did. Um, the UVA thing was – was straightforward. The board just felt like they weren't being consulted enough. And so mm -hmm. he went and romanced the board. Um, and that, that was all that was needed there. Uh, the Florida state one, you know, I think uh, Eric Barron was the president then he wanted to do the deal, but his board was in a similar place to where Rick McCullough's board is now. Um, but, you know, they didn't really have that many other good options at the time. And I think this is probably still true. Um, Florida didn't want Florida State in the SEC. Um, say it, just know. say it louder and clearer so that everyone <laughs> yes. kind of understands, understands what right. Florida State's options are. Take yeah. all of the ESPN portion of, the, of this out of the equation, like Florida, Alabama, Georgia what incentive would they have to help Florida state? They don't zero. Yeah. <laughs> what do you so, mean? The Tallahassee market? Like, right. come on, yeah, you don't get out of here. I mean, people yeah, I mean, the, the good they thing. Yeah. The good thing for me na then was that Bernie Matchin was the president of Florida and um, he had been at UNC before. And when you become a new president, the, the AAU assigns you a mentor mm -hmm. and Bernie was assigned to be my mentor. So luck I've happen. always been in touch with uh, close touch with him. Wait, the AAU um, is real. It's not just an excuse. The big 10 uses to keep schools out. <laughs> yeah. The AAU is real. It has nothing to do with sports, but, but <laughs> it is a real thing. Yeah. And Florida and North Carolina both happen to be in it. Right. So I was certain that Florida didn't want uh, Florida state and the sec that left really only the big 12 as a place for them to go. And at the time, I mean, this is all very ironic now, but at the time, the Big 12 was seen as the weakest of the Power Five. Mm -hmm. Now they're number three, I would say, quite solidly. Um, with That's a magic trick, isn't it? <laughs> it is amazing. Yeah, They lost Texas and Oklahoma. I remember when Dan Beebe was the commissioner mm -hmm. and everybody was down on him? And yeah, it's a, amazing how things have changed. Although the, the, there's nitpicking as to where that ranking is. Essentially, the Big 12 and the ACC are on comparable levels. And depending on who you ask in the industry, the ACC, especially when the Raycom deal comes off the books, the ACC will be back in that third spot. But they both share a similar problem. They're both are really far away, away yeah. from the second spot. But the one advantage, and I guess this is where we get into like-mindedness uh, amongst presidents, you know, the one advantage that the PAC that the Big 12 has now is that the schools that they're made up of have more in common than ACC schools have in common right now. And the same issues that presented themselves back in 2012, 2013, uh, before you stepped away from North Carolina, are back at it again because the same players are upset. Florida State still wants more oh, money. Yeah. How, so how'd you get them in 12 to so agree? How'd you get, yeah. How'd you get them? Yeah. So I don't know. I, I wasn't there. Swafford went down there and did his ninja swaf routine. Um <laughs> <laughs> and um, convinced them, uh, probably, he told them, you know, what he was planning to do with the contract and mm -hmm. uh, all of that. And um, shortly thereafter, they were ready. And so we had another call where everybody got on and voted uh, for the deal okay. and signed the, we all signed those contracts that you s somehow uh, obtained the copy that I signed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you were the weak link. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure how you got that, but that's okay. <laughs> um, it's probably better for everybody that it's out there. But we don't um, have the other one. The updated one. Yeah, the updated that's one. Sure. We oh, yeah. No, I don't know. I, I was gone when the updated one yeah. was done, and the term on that was very shrewdly negotiated, I have to say. I can't take credit for that. I think the first one we did was just for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, but this later one is is long term. So. I think Florida State, you know, listen, Rick McCullough and I have known each other a long time. I spoke at his installation. He's a chemist also. Um, I think he's in a tough spot with his board who thinks that um, that Florida State should have some magic spell to do more. The truth is it's been a long time since they won that championship. Mm -hmm. Was it been 10 years almost? We're getting there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, 
you know, they haven't, they haven't really put a lot on the board to make uh, another conference do a whole lot to get them. So, um, you know, I don't know what they're going to do. It sounds like they're going to try to raise money to buy out of the grant of rights deal. Uh, Cause private I, equity money always works out. Of well, that. <laughs> right. And I, I don't, you know, there has to be a number I'm sure at which yeah. they could get out. But um, the ACC is, unless there's something about the contract that I don't know about, not obligated to take that. I mean, they've mm -hmm. signed away their their rights until that contract expires. And they could pay. I mean, they're going to, guess, try to pay their way out of it. But then where are they going to go? They're not, the Big, the Big Ten's not going to take them. Um, the SEC won't take them unless, you know, as long as Florida is there. Mm -hmm. So they could go to the big 12 if it's that much better than the ACC. But it's you know, not, like you said, it's, it's debatable. Yeah. What, which one of those is, is better. Um, so I hesitate to give away free advice to Florida state, but since we're talking to you, yeah, sure. They could, they could pull a Butch Davis and get money from the big 10, the big 10 would have to be, so they'd have to become an AAU member. They'd have to go to the Big Ten because, in theory, the Big Ten would like to get into the state of Florida. Yeah. In theory, then they'd have to get the Big Ten in lieu of broadcast rights. Right? They could be a special assistant to Greg Schiano. Oh, you're not why, coaching. Why do you gotta do this to hold it? Like you're that? not coaching. <laughs> why you gotta bring that up? Wait, these are our media rights. This is a gift. This is an endowment AAU gift from the All Big right. Ten to Florida State. Right. I'm not sure I see the connection, but okay. Oh, no, your you know. guy got a, you had a pay. No, I know that. Yes. He was an executive <laughs> right. assistant. Right. He wasn't, yeah. I'm not coaching. I'm, I'm right. an executive assistant to the, to the principal, to the yeah. vice regional principal. So I, something tells me that's not going to work, but no, that's not going to work. Know. Also, <laughs> you never know. Hey, you know. Private equity money, you know, <laughs> the, the way private equity works, they could throw a bunch of money at them and then tell Mike Norvell, you're no longer the coach. We've got this AI chat bot that's going to do the plays because it's taking all your information because that's so, what private equity is about. So at what point, Holden Thorpe, you're like a certified scientific genius, right? Like, <laughs> well, I'm a guy who helps certified scientists. Well, legitimately, in your youth coming up, yeah. you know, you're like a, a prodigy, if you will. Let's let's go prodigy instead of genius. Mm -hmm. You're into science, obviously. Yeah. You become, you know, you have a leadership position academically at the school, at UNC. Then you become the chancellor. You, you know, this is a school you love. This is a school you you've you've loved your whole life. At what point did you realize you were wholly unprepared for the for the athletic portion of this? Because I don't think people realize you're the one who makes the sausage at that level. The president chancellor levels is where the decisions are made. It's not, it's not by the head coach. It's not Roy Williams. It's not Nick Saban. It's not the athletic director. It's, it's the presidents and chancellors. Yeah. Well, I think there are two different tracks. I mean, as far as this unlikely event by which I became the chair of the ACC during its most pivotal time, <laughs> you know, I think we did about as well as we could on that. As as you guys have pointed out, maybe some of the additions earlier yeah. uh, weren't Probably. necessarily the best ones uh, for football revenue anyway. But, um, you know, from Maryland leaving to getting the grant of rights done, I mean, I think those were – those were solid decisions, and and Swafford and I. Louisville, Louisville so was your Louisville. Louisville was your call. Yes, that was your watch. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we added Louisville because that's who Florida State and Clemson wanted. Okay, uh, Great Some up. some of the nerdier schools wanted a different school that you can probably guess. Um, and so uh, if you go in the um, <laughs> We're, we're you go, your process, wait, but anyway, yeah, if what, you go, what at tiny academic school yes, was out no, there? It, like, what are we were, doing here? No, it was UConn. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Was, yeah. Th look, that was all over the media that. then you guys don't. That's you right. UConn, but the way Louisville I, or UConn, but the, the way I remember it in, yeah. in sports talk radio days is that UConn wanted to be in the ACC to the point where I think them and Cincinnati were like openly wooing. Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know, like gift baskets oh. were sent and everybody kind of laughed off UConn because of football. If you're going to make these moves, it's for football and Louisville at that time had one of the largest oh, athletic yeah. budgets. Uh, not just in the ACC, yeah, but in do. the country, and they still do. So Louisville always made a heck of a lot of sense. They just had to get past the academic portion, and they sold it 
on, hey, we're ramping up. We're about to be at this level, X, Y, Z. So I'm, I'm glad you you brought us to where I wanted to go and how presidents interact. You talked about how you have a mentorship. Uh, presidents talk. It's a small group of people that end, end up doing this job. I mean, heck, there's connections with, you know, Carol Fult at North Carolina, yeah. and then she goes to Southern Cal, and now these things all kind of play out. So when the presidents start talking, that leads us to where we are right now, where there's reports of a conversation where Cal and Stanford, these remaining pack, the pack four, Whew. you know, like, hey, let's talk about bringing them on. And I'm sitting, Joe and I are sitting going, why would you do that? It makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, Cross country travel, they're not exactly known as huge football television teams, right? But you just kind of hit on it. Presidents want to be with like minded schools. And Stanford and Cal would fit in with what some presidents would want, but we're not talking football. There'd be other factors that would excite them about a Stanford Cal, and I guess that's why we're having this conversation. Yeah, so <clears throat> just to finish off the Louisville thing, mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, there were there was support for UConn, uh, <laughs> but we worked the phones and, and got the Louisville deal done. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I remember the first night uh, Louisville played a – Miami or something like that. I texted Swafford and I said, we did it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we were, I was in, I was in St. Louis by then, but, um, yeah. it was awesome. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, I did okay at that part. It was really just logic. Mm -hmm. The part, the part that I wasn't prepared for was just understanding the relative priorities of all of this compared to what I thought I was hired to do. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, you know, the trustees who hired me thought this will be so cool to get this nerdy guy to come try to make us into MIT, which I thought was the most important thing. But then I found out it wasn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I went to some jobs where I was much better suited to be. Um, but anyway, so on Cal and, and, and Stanford, I mean, look, if you throw geography out the window, which obviously we've done. <laughs> Clearly. Yeah. I, I all oceans, that, are, that, you know, all but, oceans are connected. <laughs> right. so, so, yeah. Geography is so 2012. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. uh -huh. So if, it, if it's gone and you say, okay, who makes sense in the ACC? Well, there's no question that Cal and Stanford are two of the four or five best research universities in America. So anybody would want to be a president in a club with those two schools. So I see the appeal of that. They have um, the non-revenue program at Stanford is the greatest in the world. If you put it with the non-revenue programs at North Carolina and Notre Dame, you know, you have, uh, you know, complete domination. <laughs> Um, nobody cares about that and it doesn't make any money. It's called non-revenue for a reason. Um, right. but it would be pretty awesome for guys like me who, who love to watch that stuff. Um, as far as whether it's going to help football revenue, obviously it's not. Why is, why is ESPN going to care about paying for a Cal, uh, North Carolina football game when, uh, they, they have, Bama, Georgia mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to, to sell. Um, but, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if that deal went through, if I was, I could see how the presidents would agree that that's a good thing. But I feel like, I feel like at least based on my conversations I've had with people in the last 36 hours, there's more presidents like you back in 2012, 13 or whatever it was arguing against UConn and that logic has to take okay. over and logically adding Stanford and Cal doesn't really do anything. And look, I'm of the opinion right now, Holden, that you don't want to do anything that would embolden Florida state to try to pick a fight in court over the grant of rights. The argument being, yes, when you sign a new grant of rights, they're basically rolled into membership. You can't reopen the grant of rights, but I could see Florida state and as agitating as they've been agent of chaos as they've been, saying, well, you've just decreased our value by adding these two schools that don't do anything for us. To your point, we'd rather show Georgia-Alabama or a ninth conference game in the SEC, and Florida State would try to argue their way out of it. I just feel like 
we're now into that political realm more so than the logic realm. And you've seen this play out firsthand in the room where it happened. Yeah. And listen, there are people that I know and care about and trust doing this. I mean, mm-hmm. Kevin, Randy, Susan, these are, and, and even Rick, I mean, I don't realize he's kind of a renegade right now, but he's a, he's a sharp guy. So I feel very comfortable that they're the ones that are working all this out. Um, and yeah, the, the sports decision would be not to add Cal and, and Stanford. There's mm-hmm. no question about that. Um, but it would be, uh, I, I could see um, some of the schools wanting to do that. What yeah, you, we'll see. <laughs> what do you think would be a better model for, for college sports? If you could start this thing all over again. You How, mean as far as the conferences are concerned or the whole thing? No, the whole, whole thing. thing. Like, like <laughs> yeah. I'm here saying to you, you're, you're, a, you're a prodigy in science. And, and no disrespect, man, but why in the world are you the one making decisions? About <laughs> yeah, I you tried know, to make that point. Good ones, and, and yeah. you, you were you just you illustrated what I have been talking about. That relationships are how these decisions get made. Okay, John Swafford, Jim Delaney, that helps Carolina. That's always helped Carolina when you have two powerful people like that. That helps, and I think those. I think they were both really good leaders, and I think they tried to do what was best for collegiate sports. But I'm looking at it now, and I'm looking at what Brad Kavanaugh wrote, and I'm going. Your whole model is FUBAR. Total, total FUBAR. Okay. So the only way to fix it is to blow it up and start it over. And I, I just don't see any voices go, right now in college sports going, you know what would be a really, other than Rick Patino. Yeah. <laughs> you know what would be a really good idea? Let's break football off because, quite frankly, travel for football is different than travel for volleyball and some of these other sports. It's once a week, it's that, all that stuff, you know, could easily play a regional schedule. But I just don't see anyone, including the Big Ten, who's responsible for this, mostly, going, hey, let's come up with a better idea for how to make this happen, for make this work. And it's, again, it's not Joe Giglio saying it. It's not Rick Pitino saying it. It's the Supreme Court justice saying it. And that's the part where it frustrates me. And I wish, it, I just even though I just impugned your character, I do wish okay. there was someone as smart as you in that room at least bringing up these points and saying, now, wait a second, what are we doing? How do, how do we make this better? How do we make this right? Yeah. So I agree that football has gotten into its own category. I mean, basketball uh, doesn't generate as much revenue at, at most schools. And, you know, most of the money is in the tournament. Uh, I, I don't even, I haven't looked lately at the, the ratings for a regular season college basketball games. It depends but, on the matchup. Like, yeah. Shocker. Duke Carolina sure. still does well in the ratings. Yeah, but not Duke, as well as the pinstripe bowl. That's true. Between Indiana and Wake Forest. Yeah, I mean, right. It's just college, weird. college bowl games in the middle of December against two, you know, six and six teams or whatever. Or still even Kentucky, ratings. Louisville. Yeah. Something like that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Mm-hmm. So obviously you have a whole different situation with football. And I think one of the things that, that caught people by surprise was that the gap has been widening during the time that all of this has been going on. So there was a time when, even like when I first started and Dickie was taking me through, you know, a lot of the way it all worked, where the differential between basketball and football was not nearly as great as it is now, right. especially at Carolina. Yeah. 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 So, so that ha- that is another element to this that, um, you know, people probably haven't adapted to as quickly as they should. Although Jim Delaney obviously had it completely figured out mm-hmm. uh, as Carolina he did with, as he did with many other things. <laughs> Carolina's, yeah. Carolina's running things. We'll, we'll close on this and, and Holden Thorpe mm-hmm. joining us on the Heaster Automotive Group hotline. We appreciate your time. See, I'm just a stupid state grad. What do I mean? <laughs> so you got a wonderful school over there and a great <laughs> chancellor. North Northwestern. Yeah. They released a statement when more pending lawsuits uh, popped up that they had to do some sort of a, I'm paraphrasing here because I don't have the statement in front of me, but essentially it was, we have to take a look at our relationship as an academic institution and what sports does to those types of things. If you really wanted to read into it, you could see a situation where the Northwestern president was saying, is sports really worth it? 
all things considered, when it leads to things like this and it affects our our reputation. And I, this is kind of like a two prong question. You've dealt with that that push and pull of being successful and corners cut or 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 a culture taking over that supersedes what your school mission is and it all kind of playing out publicly with various investigations and everything else. So I'm curious what you're seeing at Northwestern and whether or not presidents going forward will finally get around to asking the big question, is it worth it for us to pursue football this way? Right. So there's two things I think that are of interest. One is when you commission the report, you can be certain that when the report comes, nobody's going to be happy. Mm -hmm. All right. So remember it's Governor Martin. <laughs> okay. I've, I've lived that. All right. And because yeah. what happens is you commission the report at one point in time. Then while the report's being done, the PR people and legal people are telling you to do something they call the PR people call, put it on the credit card, which means when guys like you ask a question, you say, sorry, I can't comment on that until the report's done. Gotcha. Well, the whole time that's happening, you all are flooding the zone with all these other questions that are being asked after the report was commissioned. So when the report comes, it's like in Back to the Future when they're drawing on the chalkboard. Um, when the report comes out, it's answered the questions from when the report started, not all the ones that filled that gap mm -hmm. gotcha. where nobody was saying anything. Gotcha. Right? And this just happened at Stanford with the president on an unrelated, you know, something that wasn't related to sports, but there were questions about his research laboratory. Uh, they did the, they commissioned the report. The media kept digging up more stuff. So by Damn. the time the report came, it said, yeah, this first thing wasn't all that bad, but of course it didn't answer all these other things. Mm -hmm. So Northwestern is in the same boat right now. Um, because they've got Loretta Lynch coming to do a report. Uh, but in the meantime, the Trib and, and the Athletic and God knows who else has got umpteen people covering this thing. And it's going to be drip, drip, drip the whole time the report comes out. So well, the report is being done. So when it comes out, it ain't going to be good. I can tell you that. Okay. Um, it never is. But the bigger question you're so Northwestern needs to be preparing for some pain when that report comes. Sure. Um, so, but the bigger the, yeah. of the ACC, by the way, because his name's going to pop up a lot in this thing. Well, yeah. And that I think uh, again, uh, Kevin and, and Randy and Susan uh, and the people who are dealing with this are people that I trust. They'll figure out if they have to do anything. Uh, there when the Northwestern report comes out. But yeah, yeah I'm sure that's on their mind. Mm -hmm. um, but the bigger question of whether a school like Northwestern, which my God is a outstanding research university, like uh, it, it, it's, it's up there with, with Cal and Stanford and these other schools that we've been talking about in terms of just the powerhouse and research that it is uh, and very selective uh, for their undergraduates. Should they be even dealing with this? Uh, listen, if you're the president, I mean, there are a few schools that are in this boat, right? Notre Dame, Stanford, Duke, Vandy, Northwestern, you know, playing big time or trying to play big time sports and running these absolutely outstanding uh, universities that are not that big. And so, you know, one thing that people don't think about when they think about those schools compared to a Carolina or a Cal, which are excellent research universities also, is that the percentage of the student body that are athletes is much higher mm. at, at a Northwestern or a Duke than it is at a Cal or a UNC. Now, the, so I'm sure they're thinking, like, why am I doing this? I used, I used to think that myself, too. It's like, how did I... How did I end up here? Yeah. Um, but I don't see how they would exit. I mean, look at look at already the Northwestern fans who are fired up about this. I mean, that's why he didn't think he could fire the coach initially, right? If if the Northwestern fans didn't care, they would have fired the coach the second 
the first whiff of this yeah. came along. Yeah. But instead, Shield goes, oh, God, you know, what am I going to do? Well, I'll see if I can suspend him. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that didn't work. Uh, I went through <laughs> very similar machinations myself. Uh, and it's because the the fans have such pull and the board members are all Northwestern alumni who care about athletics. And that's who Mike Schell's working for. So he's uh, in the Kobayashi Maru. <laughs> <laughs> we're close. I know you're a Star Wars guy. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm more of a Star Wars guy, but, but you know, you know what the you know, Star you know I love is. a good Star Trek reference. You know yeah, I love okay. a good Star Trek yes. reference every right. single time. Every yeah. single time. Hold hey, it. listen, that musical episode of Strange New Worlds is just gangbusters great. I don't know I if you guys have watched it. I can't. I can't get my kids to watch it. They're too yeah. busy. They're they're too busy playing video games right now to yeah. watch some of these shows that I want to watch. Right. Holden, we appreciate the time as always. We yeah. really appreciate your insight and your candidness with these uh, with these matters right now. Because I, th- I think people need to hear it. And I'm glad that you're more than willing to talk about these things so we have a better understanding of what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, there's a lot of things that need to change. And it's not going to happen as long as everyone's hiding under their desk. So thank you guys for pulling the truth out from time to time. Move on. It's time for the mixtape, Joe, and we have a listener in studio today. Andrew, what's up, man? Not a whole bunch. How about y'all? Thanks uh, for having me in yeah. studio. Yeah, well, thanks for making the effort. Thanks for making the effort. So are you familiar with how the new mixtape works? Unfortunately, I am familiar with how the new <laughs> mixtape works. Okay, you're going to hear a PA announcer in this iteration, Wade Minter. Let's go. From the Carolina Hurricanes. Big this fan is, of Wade. This is as nice as you thought it was going to be, right? Oh, it's even better looking in person. All right. I love it. So so you're going to hear Wade announce lyrics. You're going to have to tell us what song it is. All Terrific. Right. The first the first go of this. Oh, we have a theme, too. And it's summer. Summer mixtape. First iteration didn't go so well. Uh, we had a we had a loss in the first uh, the first round with uh, with Jason. I mean, it went well. It was entertaining. It was entertaining. <laughs> but we had a loss. There was no answer. <laughs> I have to send them a cup as a consolation prize. All right, Andrew, are you ready? I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Okay, here we go. Here it is. The groove. Slightly transformed. Just a bit of a break from the norm. Just a little something to break the monotony of all that hardcore dance. That has got to be a little bit out of control. It's cool to dance. But what about the groove that sues and moves romance? Give me a soft, subtle mix. And if it ain't broke, then don't try to fix it. This might go as well as the first one did. Um, it's cool to dance. Did you know it? Yeah, I did know that. Oh. Okay. Summer, summer, summertime. It's Fresh Prince, summertime. Summertime by Fresh Prince. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I was about to say. Let's Andrew. just sit back and unwind. How old are you, Andrew? Late 20s. That's still not an excuse. That's like a ubiquitous song. It's on all the time. Yeah, Andrew, it's like it's, the, it's, the the staccato, the the <laughs> delivery is very can be very confusing. Yes. It is tough with the delivery. And if there was a basketball courts in the summer got girls there, maybe you can come up with it. Maybe. But you know, that's maybe. tough. Did I make this too hard? Actually, this makes you I happy because we we're not giving these away. I have a good consolation prize. Do we have a right consolation here. prize? <laughs> Can't do it on the air, but we have a good one. All right. All right. (laughs) Andrew, thanks for coming up, man. Thanks for having me. And thanks for listening. Next topic, please. (sighs) Have I made them too hard? No. I mean, I think there are some identifiable lyrics, particularly in the summer genre. Yeah. But okay the delivery can be because you you have to mismatch your brain to what you're normally hearing yeah in a melody song version okay. to and in this case wade kind of throwing you off the scent just just ever just so slightly smidge, just a ever smidge so in his very wade way anyway thanks to andrew for coming on by uh let's get out of here with some hey joe questions brought to you by oakwood pizza box uh, check them out online at oakwoodpizzabox.com give them a call at 919-594-1605 better yet just drop on by it's a really cool spot it's old school baby you got the brick you got the red plastic cups for your for your drinks and they got narragansett on tap pizza. which 
no, well, yes, pizza's money, but you need the beer with the pizza. <laughs> and Narragansett is a picture of that with the pizza is really, really good. All right. Uh, let's go to, oh, Holden Thorpe, who was just on with us. Uh, he made a reference to the oh. 1976 Honeycut Giants, and there he is, number 72. Which is the zoom in on a young Holden Thorpe. Yeah, he played. He played more football than me. So who am I to say he had his hand in the, in the dirt, dirt, Joe? You're right. So You're don't right. question his bona fides when it comes to <laughs> understanding football dynamics. That man played football, Joe. When football was football, <laughs> when could, I could taste the plastic from those helmets. Cool. <laughs> All right, let's go to the YouTube comments. Oh, uh, this is from Ludicrous ninety four ninety four. Hey Joe, all this talk about traveling for Washington and Rutgers team, which is in the air about five hours and fifteen minutes nonstop from Seattle, Newark. Then they would have to take the bus to campuses. What is the longest distance fans of teams have to commercially travel in the ACC now? Intern Ooh. travel agent Cal homework assignment. I have to text him after this. Yeah, I'm thinking it would take two hours to drive to any commercial airport just to go to Virginia Tech. No, I don't think it's that much. No, you can fly it to Roanoke. But the, but how far is the drive from Roanoke? Oh, to, it's less than an hour. Is it less than an hour? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna admit something. Never been to VT. Never been to VT. I've never flown to VT. But and if you asked me, if you showed me the state of Virginia, yeah. And you asked me to identify where Blacksburg is. I'm not sure I could do it. Really? I'm not sure I could do it. Low in the lower western, southwestern part of the state. You you could be pulling a John Oliver on me and be showing me a map of Hawaii <laughs> and go, yeah, that's totally where it is. No, wrong. I that's Hawaii. I prefer the drive to Blacksburg over the drive to Charlottesville. Okay. Because it's all interesting. Uh, from Mr. Mo, hey Joe. Can't they just use European football Premier League format in college sports? No, because what happens in the EPL is very un-American. Yeah. Very un-American. Well, supposedly American. But <laughs> well, no. It's look, an American concept. American <laughs> concepts are basically, we get to keep all the money and well, there's no consequences for failure. That's right. the most American thing possible. <laughs> all right. Uh, from Bay Pack, since this crap is full on nuts, why not this? The ACC adds Cal and Sanford. Then the ACC sends Florida State, Boston College, and Syracuse. Uh, and Louisville to the Big 12 with no exit fees, released from the Granite Rights. Big 12 sends ACC, Arizona, Arizona State, and West Virginia. So your new ACC would have a Western division of Cal, Stanford, Arizona, and Arizona State, a tobacco division with the Big Four, a North division with UVA, Virginia Tech, Pitt, and West Virginia, your guys, and then a South division with Clemson, Georgia Tech, Miami, and Notre Dame. I like how Notre Dame's in the South. It's like the old uh, NFC West where the Carolina <laughs> Panthers were. In the division. Yes. <laughs> the Falcons and the Panthers in the West. In the West. That's too, that's too much fantasy, guys. That's just too much fantasy. And we'll get out of here on this. It looks like Florida State fans uh, figured out our YouTube channel. No wonder these two only have three K subs. Terrible take, period. Clown show. Ooh. You guys are clowns. Oh, a lot of clowns. Clowns. It's big. Huge. Do I look like a clown? Do, Do I look I, like a clown to you? you? Do you want me to make you a balloon? Do I amuse you? Am I funny? Ha ha. Funny ha. Anyway, that's going to wrap it up for today's edition of Ovi's and Julia. We will see you Thursday.